the American Theatre Wing, and the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts bring you the American Theatre Wing's Guide to Careers in the Theatre. This session, the Advertising Agency. Hello, I'm Pia Lindstrom with the American Theatre Wing, and with me today is Nancy Coyne. Nancy Coyne is the CEO of the largest theatrical agency in the United States, such shows as Aida, 42nd Street, Mamma Mia, The Producers. She's also taught at Yale and Columbia University entertainment marketing. What is entertainment marketing? Well, it's really just putting butts in seats. That's what I do for a living. I've been doing it for 27 years, and I must say, uh, it gets to be more interesting every day. Well, how do you get those butts in the seat? Well, there are many, many things that are open to us now, avenues to, to encourage people to go to the theater. It used to be, once upon a time, you just put up a poster, and that was how people knew what was coming to town, what was in town, and to go see it. Now we have television advertising, radio advertising billboards, all sorts of tie-ins with corporate sponsors. There's a, there's a, it's not a science, it's mm -hmm. still a, an, an art, I suppose, but there are a lot of ways to go about it. Is it very different from product advertising? Well, the biggest difference is there's no shelf life to a theater ticket. I have to sell that ticket tonight. Mm -hmm. If I don't get you to go to see the show tonight, I don't get a chance to sell that seat again tomorrow. So I never have the luxury of devising a campaign mm -hmm. for a show and waiting to see if it works. And if it doesn't work, I'll come up with another campaign. We have to get it right, right off the bat, because a show won't stick around for two or three months to help you get it right. You have to have really good instincts for this. So there's an immediacy. There is. There is an absolute um, get them in there today philosophy in our agency. When you say an instinct for this, mm -hmm. tell me about that. I think of, I, I loved the theater ever since I went to my first Broadway show when I was 10 years old. We came from Silver Spring, Maryland, and I saw um, Mary Martin in The Sound of Music, and Ethel Merman in Gypsy in one weekend. And I went back to Silver Spring, a completely different child. And I've always loved being in the audience. I've always loved sitting there. Two hours spent in the theater is, I think, two hours better spent than anywhere else on earth. So what I try to do is communicate that sense of enthusiasm through the advertising to other people out there and encourage them to go to the theater and to bring their children. I think of myself as being in audience development as well because mm -hmm. every time you take a child to a show, you are developing a, a client for the future, mm -hmm. someone who will grow up to take their children to the theater. Tell me, who hires you? I'm hired by the producers of a show. They usually hire me very early in the process, sometimes before they even have the money to put the show on. I'll get a script. I'll be asked, how do I see presenting this to the public? What would be my idea of the hook that would get it out mm -hmm. and make it appealing to people all in the tri-state area, because Broadway is the area I deal with. Mm -hmm. Many of the shows that I do here travel to other parts of the country, and I handle them when they're in other parts of the country. And that's a different challenge, because what somebody might want in Oklahoma is a little different than what the New York population might want. But there's a large constituency of tourists that come mm -hmm. as well. So my two areas of expertise, as I see it, are the tourist market, the tourists who come to New York, giving them what they want, and the New York tri-state area, making sure that they have what they want. So I'll get involved very early on. I'll read a script. I'll come up with some ideas. I'll discuss it with the producers. And at that point, I'm usually hired. Do you work on casting? Do you say, I'm going to need a star here to promote? I, I have suggested that. The, the, the opinion of the advertising agency is rarely taken into account <laughs> when that uh, decision is made. But if you think about it, who's in a play is a very important marketing mm -hmm. decision. It's the first question a uh, prospective audience mm -hmm. member will ask. Well, who's in it? And if that, if that question can be answered, as in the case of The Graduate, with um, Kathleen Turner, Jason Biggs and Alicia Silverstone, then you've gone a long way to solving all your marketing problems because three stars in a play with a familiar title, well, that's good marketing. That's a sound campaign. The public will want to see it. I don't have to do too much work on a show like that. What's the difference between the publicist, the press agent, and the advertising representative? It's, it's easy. The publicist gets the coverage that is free. 
the, the interviews, the feature articles, anything that the press chooses to write about is done with the encouragement of the press agent. I pay for my space. When you see a full page ad in the, in the New York Times or any other newspaper, it was purchased by the producers through the advertising agency. So they give you a budget. The producer then gives Absolutely. you a budget and says, I have $200,000? The general manager. I deal with the general manager and the producer working together. And the general manager usually is in charge of the financial aspects of the ad campaign. And they'll say, you're over budget, you're under budget. This is what our weekly should be. This is how much money we want to spend up to the first preview. This is how much money we want to spend first preview to opening night. This is how much money we want to spend every week thereafter. But yes, I am accountable to the producers and, and general manager for staying within their ad budget. Well, how do you decide, say you get a play, how do you decide whether it should go on the side of a bus mm -hmm. or in the subway or in an ad in the New York Times? Well, that's actually our first assignment. We'll sit down, we'll take a play or a musical and decide how we want to sell it and then where best to sell it. If it's a show like, um, well, we have an interesting one coming up, Moving Out. Mm -hmm. It's the music of Billy Joel, choreographed by Twyla Tharp. So you sit there and say, okay, television to show the great, great dancing, or radio, because we've got the Billy Joel music. In, in our case, we picked the Billy Joel music, not because it's superior to the Twilight Tharp dancing, but because radio is very, very effective during the summer. And that's the period of time that we'll be advertising it. That's the preliminary period of advertising. So we would decide to do radio in the summer, and then when it opens, do television in the fall. All throughout this, there'll be print, there'll be, I mean, it's, it's like working with a pie. If, we, if we're given a million dollars, we have to decide, in addition to how, what kind of pie to bake, how we're going to divvy it up. Is a million dollars a typical A million dollars is amount? a relatively average budget okay. pre-opening for a big musical. Okay. Uh, a play could have m two, three hundred thousand prior to opening. And then the weekly advertising costs on Broadway average from 10000 for an off-Broadway play or a small Broadway play to as much as 75000 for a big musical. Do you use focus groups? We, we use research more and more. We use focus groups to help us make our marketing and, and advertising choices, which poster will work, which copy line is most uh, evocative, which, which radio spot makes you think, which announcer on the radio spot do you relate to most, which television storyboard do you prefer. So quite frequently we use, we use focus groups and then we also do some quantitative research on the back end to find out what stations people listen to, what television programs they watch what papers they read, how they respond to the advertising they see. Where do you find these people that go into these groups who the tell you these groups? things? Oh, yes, they're, or anything. They're, they're very easy to find. They love giving you their opinion. <laughs> we usually go to New Jersey. We have a facility <laughs> out in New Jersey, and we do maybe three groups an evening out there. And they're fascinating. We've heard things that we never in a million years could have come up with on our own. Um, some woman once said to us, I know that show's a big hit. And the reason I know it's a big hit is because I saw it on the side of a bus. <laughs> and I thought, wow, is it the size of the, the bus poster? And she said, no, they wouldn't have gone to all that trouble to paint the bus if it wasn't going to run. So I thought, OK, there's a certain permanence when you put a bus sign on. And if you think back over the years, you haven't seen too many flops on the side of a bus. <laughs> You paint the bus? Literally, you paint no, the she, bus? That's what she that's thought. That's what she thought. Oh, okay. She I thought, thought maybe that. <laughs> no, we just put uh, flex faces, they're called. They're plastics that, that go up on the side of the bus. What about outside the theater? Sometimes they paint theaters, oh, I see, on the outside. We get more and more elaborate. The front of house. Is that called. your? That's my domain Your as domain? Well. Yep. And I how do you decide of, about that? Well, usually you want a representation of what's inside mm -hmm. the show. Sometimes you don't. Cats decided they were going to paint the Winter Garden Theater black. Mm -hmm. And the logo was two eyes with dancers inside the eyes. And they were going to maintain that sense of mystery right out to the front of the theater. And they weren't going to let anyone see what was going on inside until they paid their money and took their seat. 
these logos, mm -hmm. how are they designed? Or well, we have an in-house we have an in-house studio of about 14 graphic artists oh. who work on the posters. Frequently, we use a huge pool. I mean, it is New York, and we go to California and London as well. But we use a huge pool of freelance talent. When we sit down and think, you know, who would be perfect for this? Um, let's let's hire. Uh, you name an, an artist, a certain mm -hmm. artist, and we'll get him to do this, and he'll be, he'll be great. And it's usually decided by a creative director, who is the person who is in charge of the creative aspects of a, of a show, the art director who's in charge of the design of the show, not the show itself, mm -hmm. but the advertising of the show, and the account person, the person who handles the money. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of very talented people that Broadway can't afford to work on posters or poster design. You have some here. I do. Can we look at them? Sure. This gives us the idea of what they actually look like. Some of these will be like. very familiar. That's this the is, producers. This is the producers. Right. We wanted a picture of Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick. Right. And we also wanted a logo that was the door that you might see to the producers. One of the things that's a challenge about theater advertising and logo design is these proportions. Billing is always a factor. When you design a Coke can, you don't have to have two names above the title 100%. That's some of the challenges that we go into. This one wasn't particularly difficult, but certain other ones in here were. Um, Les Mis is uh, a, a concept that was taken right out of a book of um, Les Miserables. This is Cosette, the youngest little girl in the story. And um, it was done in London by our affiliate agency, which is De Winters, and they've been responsible for some of the great English logos that have transferred here to America. And now you sometimes see this without Les Miserables. Absolutely. Uh, if, if, a logo, recognize if a logo is good, really good, and mm -hmm. a show runs for a period of time, the logo comes to stand for the show, and you don't even need a title. I think if you showed this now, after five years on Broadway, you wouldn't need to say The Lion, the Lion King. King. People know that. Now, these are all different artists that do these. You don't use the same people, and they're not in-house. Um, some of this, this was done by an in-house artist. This was done by an in-house artist in oh. De Winters in London. That came from London uh, as well. Um, this is a photograph. Sometimes well, what you need to do is communicate the who's in it more than anything else, and that was Terry Hatcher, the star of the touring production. This is a, a logo that has evolved over the years in one way, shape, or form. It went from the movie. The movie. Exactly. Well, and I we remember just that adapted it to the to live me. show. This is actually, these two were both done in-house, and mm -hmm. they feature the chorus, I which I love. Sometimes yes. the chorus is the star of the show, and when it is, you need to, to get that message out. And who decides that? Is that something you decide? Mm -hmm. and that's part of your job? Is that's to part come of my up? job. To, to get down to the basic creative strategy. How are we going to communicate with the public? What can we say about Kiss Me Kate that's going to appeal to the person sitting out there who has to decide, what am I going to do next Friday night? Am I going to go to a show? Why should I pick this show? Well, this show looks like it's going to be fun. And after a while, you get a sense of what people want. You go to enough focus groups and, and listen, and they'll tell you what they want to see. You know, we once did a show called The Rink with right. Cheetah Rivera and Liza, Liza Minnelli. Okay. And it was a story of a mother and a daughter who lived underneath the, the, the roller coaster at Coney Island. And it didn't sell particularly well. It didn't get all that great reviews. But we thought, gee, Liza Minnelli, Cheetah Rivera, they have such followings. I wonder why there's not a bigger crowd outside the theater. And so we went and interviewed the people that were there. And we interviewed the people in the TKTS line, standing in line for discount tickets, to find out why they weren't going to make the rink their first choice. And they said, well, because we've seen the pictures, and they're wearing street clothes. I said, what? They're wearing jeans. I said. Yeah. And they said, when we see Liza Minnelli and we see Cheetah Rivera, we want sequins. So, I mean, if that research had been done prior to the show, they, they might have decided to do a different kind of a show. But we literally realized that showing these people in the costumes of the play itself was a turn off, not a turn on, even though we had two stars. It's how people want to see stars, the context. What else have you got here for us? The Music Man. This is a good one. 
This is a good one because... With a child, it doesn't even have the stars. That's right. When you think the music man, you think Robert Preston. Yes. That was our problem. That mm -hmm. was the challenge here. And the way to overcome it is to say, wait a minute, the music man, yeah, it's about the music man, but it's also about children. And it's for children. It's a great mm, show to uh, bring for, a child right. to. So let's concentrate on Winthrop, the little boy who has the lisp. And let's make that our focus. Does the producer approve this yes. finally, or yes. it's your final approval? No, 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 no. It's always goes, it's back. Always goes back to the producer. Now, sometimes you have these days dozens of producers. I yes. mean, I guess in the old days there might have been one or two. Now that's you right. can have six or seven. It's much more difficult. Well, how do you deal with all those guys? Well, or women? Uh, that's they're both. <laughs> they're both. It's, that's part of the challenge, is getting a consensus of opinion. And hopefully I will put up eight or nine different approaches mm -hmm. to a show mm -hmm. and I have my favorite I hope that I can get them all to have my favorite as their favorite as well but it's a, it's the art of compromise so you have to come up with eight or nine ideas it's usually Usual. safest to do that <laughs> of different ways to approach it that's a lot of ideas I have on occasion mm -hmm come up with an idea and been so certain that that was the way to go that that would be all I would present I wouldn't it's a dangerous tactic to take because you if you're shot down you have no fallback position but occasionally you believe in a in a in a direction and it sort of breaks your heart to go in any other mm -hmm. direction so you simply take that direction and you show it in all different media if you really believe one way is the right way to go you'll do a poster a radio spot mm -hmm. the storyboard for a television commercial and you'll show them how this one concept can be executed across all disciplines and that's a pretty effective way to sell it to show how it will work everywhere. What do you have to study in order to know how to do this? Difficult people. I mean, it's, it, producers are creative by, by definition. Mm -hmm. That they want to be in the theater means they're a little different than the regular businessman. I mean, if you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense financially on paper mm -hmm. being in the theater business. There are only eight performances a week. You have a fixed number of tickets you can sell to each performance. And therefore, you have a cap, you have a top, a ceiling mm -hmm. on how much money you can make in a given week. That's sort of not the American way. We want to believe that if we work hard enough, the sky's the limit. Well, you can only do a show eight times a week, so the sky isn't the limit. Therefore, it takes a person who actually loves the theater, who feels about it the way I feel about mm -hmm. it, and has chosen to make a little less and by doing so works in a little less of a business-like world. Um, it's, it's, a it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to get all of these people in a room together and get them thinking as one, because that's what you need to do. You need to have one campaign. What do you have to know as a, uh, what are the, the, your educational background? My does, educational oh, background. Well, what does somebody come with to this business, well, for example, the I, advertising business? I mean, I have many young people who work for me who were communications majors. Mm -hmm. Some were theatrical, who had designs on going on the stage. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of frustrated singers and actors <laughs> and dancers mm -hmm. in my agency. They understand the theater, and then when they get there, we teach them the art of advertising. To have an advertising background and to go into theater, I don't think is as valuable in my world as having a theater background and learning the advertising business, because we're so not like a regular ad agency. We so have a different, we work very late at night now, not that other agencies mm -hmm. don't, but our right. shows don't close till 11. So we sort of feel on call until mm -hmm. the curtain goes down. We're there most nights. If you want to change an ad at the last minute, if the star's ankle is broken, as they say <laughs> in 42nd yes, yes, Street, yes. and a new name has to go into the ad, they come to us and we get it done at the very last minute. So that's, you can learn the business of theatrical advertising. Mm -hmm. You can't learn to love the theater. If you have no instincts or feelings for theater, and it, it, it'd be very hard to do what we do, which is just basically generate enthusiasm. So first thing, a person, if they're thinking of this profession, needs to love the theater. Yes. If they are in school, what courses would you suggest they take? Well, I mean, the disciplines that we work with, there are writers in the agency, there are designers in the agency, there are business majors in the agency. There are people who have a very you know, strong sense of marketing, who have learned marketing 
in the in the traditional sense, in the in the very conventional sense, as if they were going to go work for Procter and Gamble. Mm -hmm. I have someone who worked for me, went and got her MBA, is working at Procter and Gamble, and is going to come back. Just promise me <laughs> she'll come back because she loves the theater. But she thought she could be of more value to me if she learned hardcore marketing and how to best get the most bang for your buck at Procter and Gamble, and then come back. Is that so, true, or is it just so different, as you said? It, she has a love for the theater, okay. so I really believe that she'll be back. Mm -hmm. Someone who has is just a good packaged goods marketing person mm -hmm. probably doesn't stand a chance in this business because it will be too loosey-goosey for them. <laughs> they won't be able to <laughs> deal with the fact that people, some of my clients, change their mind or pick a color or do something completely on a whim, which is why they're in the theater in the first <laughs> place, so that they can exercise their whims. So what you need is psychology then, Brad. Psychology Maybe you should take a psychology helpful. course very instead helpful. of uh, marketing. Absolutely. That would be very helpful. And do you have to work with people, with groups of people? Oh, is this yeah. something you... Everyone, everyone in the agency learns to deal with large groups of people. Today, it is not uncommon to have 22 producers on a show that has two characters. When the, <laughs> when the producers in the conference room outnumber the people on the stage by 10 to 1, you know you're going to have a difficult assignment. It's not going to be easy. So you have to have uh, people skills. People skills, absolutely. And I guess you don't learn that in too many classes. Um, it, we do a lot of on-the-job training. Right. Once you survive one meeting on a show that just opened to bad reviews, you've got a, a good, you're halfway down the path to knowing how to do a job. Would you get blamed when they get bad reviews? Absolutely. Really? Well, you, they need someone. <laughs> it's not the actor? It can't be the show. <laughs> no. If the show's a hit, it's because the show is great. If the show's a flop, the ad was wrong. <laughs> and that's another thing you get used to very quickly. So you have to have some thick skin to take that. Very. Very, very. thick. Another attribute Absolutely. here that you need. So you can't take it personally. No. Well, you have a lot of temperament. We know that about people in the mm -hmm, theater. So mm -hmm. you, have, you come across that sometimes? Absolutely. Violent tempers I've, and I've uh, had the, hysteria. I've, I've had the walls to my conference room punched in <laughs> by someone on an opening night who got a very disdainful review. <laughs> hope it wasn't mine. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> what is your personal background? I mean, how did you find your way well, into I this? I wanted to be on the stage. I had a oh. stage mother who thought that I was, you know, Washington, D.C.'s <laughs> answer to Shirley Temple. And I came to New York thinking I would be an actress. I got rejected a couple of times. I think I went to two auditions, and I thought, well, that's <laughs> enough of that. I don't want to do that. And I then took a job writing advertising copy for a radio station. It was a small radio mm -hmm. station. And they had a lot of little clients who didn't have their own ad agencies. So I was the in-house writer. And one of the small agencies that had ad agencies that bought time on this radio station was an agency called Blaine Thompson. And they didn't really have a creative department at that time. They were still of the era where you just put up the poster and people came to the shows. This was in the mm -hmm. 70s. And so I got the assignment to do radio copy for some of the, these Broadway shows. And since I loved going to Broadway shows, I thought this was the greatest assignment on earth. And I poured my heart into these assignments. And I would go down to the studio and I would get the music from the musicals and I'd mix it and I'd have my friends come in and do voiceovers. And I made some, <laughs> some really cute radio spots and the agency hired me to do it. And about two years later, a couple of people at the agency, we left and started our own shop in 1977. So uh, another thing that people could do if they were interested in this business is get a job in radio or as an intern in a radio or I television think a radio station. station. I think a radio station it, or a television station is a wonderful place to start many careers. I mean, at, the nice part about a radio station, a small radio station, is you get to do such a variety of different mm. things. And you really you learn to communicate with the public in a very... The, one of the things I love about radio is it's a medium of words. It's mm -hmm. To me, it's an interactive medium. You speak, and the audience out there is forced to imagine what you were talking about. And so I, I love words, and I love the power that I had with them to make people do things. And it was natural that I would extend it into other kinds of advertising. I still use radio a lot for Broadway shows, and I still find it very effective. When you teach at Yale or Columbia, mm -hmm. what sort of class do you give in this? I have um, a, a semester-long class at Yale this year, and I have for 15 years. In, it's called theater marketing, and we um, 
I have about 12 students. Six of them are from the drama school. They're getting their MFA in theater administration. They want to go out and run nonprofit theaters. And these are people I think of as my future clients. Mm -hmm. So I try to train them to be good clients. On the other side, I have the business school, about six kids who are getting their MBA. Mm -hmm. And they're going to probably go into more traditional forms of marketing and advertising. But entertainment advertising, entertainment marketing with movies and television mm -hmm. and cable is becoming such a big field. They want to know a little bit about the entertainment world. So that's why they're an interesting addition to the class. And I basically start at the very beginning and I teach them how to read a script, how to find an idea, how to come up with a creative strategy, how to target an audience, how to decide who this play is for and what you need to tell that person. We start by when we read the script and decide who it's for, we draw a profile of the person that we think is going to best love that play. And we decide whether it's a woman or a man, whether he lives in New Jersey or, or uh, Long Island, does he drive a car, does he take the train, and then we do a profile of what we consider to be the perfect person to see this play. Because basically all theater lives on word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So if we get the right person in in the early days, of a play. Hopefully he'll go out and tell his friends or her friends to go see this. The trick is to get the right person there first. So you design this person and then mm -hmm. you write the ad and for then we write the ad exactly for, for that absolutely. person. And we start huh. with we start with a, a direct mail piece, a postcard or a letter, and we write it, dear theater goer, but we have in mind that specific theater goer. There's a new play coming, we'd like to tell you about it. And then we, we come up with our the words that we're going to use to describe this particular piece of theater. Is there a, a union for a uh, Theater? No. You're not? No. We're one because of the, I think press agents. We're one of the one. few disciplines connected with the theater that is not unionized. Do you have an apprentice program within, I, or do other advertising agencies have apprentice programs? We're not large enough to have an apprentice program. We hire interns usually every summer, sometimes during the school year, but they pretty much have to seek us out. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing is how industrious some of these people are. My name appears only in the back of a playbill in very tiny type, but I have actually had people come to me who grew up in North Dakota and who said, every time I came to the theater, I saved my playbill and I saw your name in the back over the years and I'd like to come to work for you. And, and they're halfway in the door right off the bat just because I so admire the industriousness that it takes to, to seek out this career. It's not immediately apparent where we come from. Mm -hmm. Advertising is everywhere. So sometimes you don't think, like, who created that? Where did it come from? And people who, who know us in the business know what we do. But the, the public in general, I don't know that they make the distinction between press agents mm -hmm. and advertising agencies or marketing firms. I think they just think they've been sold the idea that Oklahoma is the musical to see, and they go and buy the ticket. I don't think they're, they're aware of exactly who did what. But I suppose there is some blurring of the lines getting an article into a magazine, maybe because you know a writer or somebody on the magazine and you suggest it? Well, when we have ad meetings, which is usually once a week for a Broadway show, it's a meeting with the press agent as well. And the strategy, whether it applies to paid advertising or to S feature articles is the same strategy. We're going to push certain elements of a play, mm -hmm. whether we push it to writers at, for, for uh, there's an interesting article in the New York Times today on the hair in Thoroughly Modern Millie. And it got much more space than any of us had any idea. She does have a great, great wig on in Thoroughly Modern mm -hmm. Millie. But that's one of the things from day one we knew we had to sell in our poster. The was wigs? this great bob. <laughs> oh. She's got this great bob. And it's out there in all the posters. And now people know how she got it. <laughs> so that's part of your job, not the press agent's job, is to come up with the hair or the well, hook. to come up with the hook. The hook. The strategy. The way we're going to approach the public. The tone of how we talk. Are we going to talk tongue in cheek? Are we going to be mm -hmm. serious? Is this the theatrical event of the decade or a fun evening in the theater? What's, what, what do we want people to take away? Mm -hmm. When, they, when you say, elephant man, what do you want them to give you back? 
Sometimes it's very... Are you doing Elephant Man? Yes. Well, there's one. What do you want people to... Uh, well, first what, and how foremost... Do, tell, take me a little bit through that, okay. because that's about to open. How um, would you have done this that? This is a revival. Mm -hmm. I'm in the position now, unfortunately, of having worked on shows <laughs> the second time. So I remember the first campaign, because I did the first campaign. Mm -hmm. A revival's a little different, because you've, you've had the first campaign under your belt. The title is somewhat established. In this case, between the first Broadway production and this current Broadway mm -hmm. production, there's been a movie. So we're not introducing a subject that no one's ever heard of. The Elephant Man has that he is John Merrick, mm -hmm. the period, the time. That's a little bit known, and that's certainly our first audience, the people who don't have to have it all explained to them. What we bring in this production is Billy Crudup and um, Rupert Graves and Kate Burton. And so we knew instantly we wanted a photograph of those people because that's what I wanted people to take away. Oh, this is the Elephant Man with Billy Crudup. I see. And then we said, okay, but we don't want it to look like three headshots. We want it to look very interesting. So we hired a photographer, Deborah de Turbville, who is um, wonderful. Everything that she shoots, I don't care if it was shot yesterday in Soho, it looks like it was an old, old photograph. Mm. And we then treated it in such a way that it looks like possibly it was of the time period. Very, very modern, very mm -hmm. hip, very edgy, mm -hmm. but still a period of effect. And what's the takeaway? The general takeaway is this is a, an important play. This is a play with three stars, a message, and it probably should go on to your must-see list. I should. So you don't emphasize uh, his deformity oh, or no. something, uh, or show the man with a sack on his head. No. As they did in, in the, the movie. In the so, film. In the film, yeah, that was He's what I took away from it. If absolutely. You want to remember, that my image was just the guy with a bag on his head. Right. Well, the 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 startling thing about this production, as the original production, is there is no deformity. Mm -hmm. Billy Crudup acts the yes, deformity. Yes. And in time, you come to think you've seen it there. You come to believe that's good acting. That is. That is good acting. How much can a, an advertising person earn? Well, we um, our starting salaries for an assistant, the way you, the way you get into the, the business at my agency is you start usually as an assistant account executive, mm -hmm. which is probably a glorified name for uh, a secretary mm -hmm. who takes a lot of the, the bad phone calls. I mean, <laughs> an average assistant in the agency makes around $25,000 and gets around 85 voicemails when they go out to lunch. <laughs> so most of them don't go out to lunch. It's just easier to stay at your desk and take the phone calls as they come in than let them pile up. So the first thing you have to do is deal with all these angry people. Yeah, and it's not just the, the producers and the client side. Then we have to deal with all the media. I mean, ah. there are deadlines if you want to put an ad in the... I mean, we have newspaper advertising, radio advertising, television advertising, billboard advertising, subway advertising, sides of buses, tops of taxis, phone kiosks. There's a million places to put the name of a mm. Broadway show. And somebody's going to get the call that says, where are your plastics? We don't have your posters. <laughs> we can't put them up on the Long Island Railroad because we haven't got them yet. Are they at the printers? Oh. Not to mention printers. It's a whole other subject. So but it's it's that's the starting salary I would say is twenty five thousand dollars. It goes up to a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars. The more you can supervise every aspect of a Broadway show. So you need real management skills. Yes. it sounds like in yes. addition. And at the top level on the business end of it, the mm -hmm. accounts supervisors are people who have three or four account executives under them. They're responsible for three or four Broadway shows in the supervisory capacity. They have someone specifically assigned to that show, but the buck stops with them. On the creative side, there's a creative director who works with the account supervisor, and he may have a couple of writers and a couple of art directors under him, but he's responsible for the look and the sound of everything that goes out with the advertising. So you have at your top level the account supervisor, the creative director, and then there's a whole other department of media buyers who we go in and say, all right, this is going to appeal to women 25 to 54 who have a strong theater going background and who um, live within a 10 mile radius. We don't think people are going to drive too far to see this play, so let's concentrate in Manhattan.
and they'll come back to us and say, here's the two radio stations that will deliver best for you. Here's the magazine we think we should, you should be in. Here are the newspapers. Here are the days of the week that we want them to be in. So there's a media director, an account supervisor, a creative director, and then at the far end is the billing person who sends, who puts all these figures together and sends the client a bill for our services each week. On television, do you decide what program the commercial will be on? Absolutely. Do you say we're going to put it on the news or we're going to put it on uh, Absolutely. Sex in the City? We know. sometimes <laughs> decide based purely yeah. upon demographics, the, the people who are watching at that time. Sometimes we decide based upon the content of the show. Mm -hmm. A show that's just opened will likely be on the news mm -hmm. because it's news to Broadway. And so we want people who want to know what's happening today we'll put a commercial on the news. But there are some programs that are just enormously efficient for all theater goers. The, the prime access and the fringe programming. Um, in New York right now, it uh, happens to be Channel 11 has uh, Friends and a Raymond. Uh, everybody loves mm -hmm. Raymond from oh. 11 to 12. And those numbers pull very well and the prices, the spots are priced very affordably. So you'll see a lot of theater advertising on that particular hour. The news pro morning programs are also very effective. Theater goers tend to watch those each morning. But y you don't deal with the critics. That would be the press agent. Correct. But you take the words of, I the, take critics the, words of the critics and then put them in the ad. I do. You, you're the one who selects? Yes. And sometimes I select quite creatively. <laughs> I, I, I'm not embarrassed to say I never twist words. I never, I never misquote. But I sometimes do um, lead a, a person to believe that a critic liked to show a liked little more than they everything did. when they really said, "I just like the sets were fabulous." I'm not. I'm not <laughs> fond of doing that. Yes, I'm not but, fond of pulling something out. But I am uh -huh. fond of taking, you know, one word like brilliant. If they said brilliant oh. sets, I wouldn't put the brilliant <laughs> okay. in in, he in the headline. But if they said a brilliant production, mm -hmm. you just see brilliant. And they might have said a brilliant production of a terrible play. <laughs> You'll see brilliant from me. <laughs> so you have to be very crafty in your business too. It we're, sounds like we're crafty, rather clever. We're crafty, but I I don't believe in misleading people. It always it always bites you when in the back when you get around to the end of the day. You mentioned account executive. Mm -hmm. What exactly is an account executive? An account executive <laughs> doesn't actually take those 85 phone calls, but yes. he makes sure that someone does. He's uh -oh. responsible. He reports to the client, and he's the one the client can call up and say, I hate the way my ad looked in the paper today. It was on the wrong page. It oh. was on the movie page. And he deals with the, the vendors, the New York Times, the Post, mm -hmm. the News, the radio stations. He'll make sure that we, that the client's dollar is well spent. We frequently spend a lot of time chasing the media to give us make goods on ads that didn't print well, on oh. spots that didn't run where they were promised, on things that are a little, a little less than what we think we paid for. So I would say he holds the pocketbook for the client and makes sure that we get our, the client gets his money's worth. So not only do you have to think up all these ads, you then have to monitor Absolutely. all the radio and television and newspapers Absolutely. to be sure they, they run it that way. I get the papers in the morning and I open it to the theater section and my heart sinks when I see an ad that didn't print well because I know that's a bunch of phone calls that will have to be made. When I see an ad that, ad that has poor placement that's not on the page that we guaranteed, I know, okay, today we're going to have a problem with that because somehow what we, what we were promised wasn't what was delivered. Tell me, what's the one of the worst experiences you've had with a play? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's the problem with having done this for 27 <laughs> years. Um, well, Big River was a musical that was um, a challenge because it was set, obviously, on the Mississippi. It's the... Mm -hmm. the, the um, based on the Tom Sawyer legend and a story. And on the stage, the raft was a wooden raft. Do you remember this production? <laughs> a wooden raft that, that went from stage right to stage left and upstage and downstage. And after a while, because it was the theater, you bought the convention. Mm -hmm. And you said, OK, I'm with you. I'm going to imagine the Mississippi. <laughs> 
But television doesn't work that way. People are used, if, if, if you want to see the Mississippi on television, <laughs> on film, you want to see the Mississippi. So I convinced the producers that we would shoot that commercial in the water. So I had to take and build a raft that was the duplicate of the raft on the stage and put it in a body of water. And we went up the sawmill, and off the sawmill there is now, I think, a Mexican restaurant that backs up to some tributary of the Hudson. And it was as muddy as you can get. And I watched the cast, which included John Goodman, uh -huh. sink into the mud. <laughs> <laughs> and I watched money like fly out the window, but it, we ended up with a commercial. But that was that was the day in which the raft and my heart sort of sank. And, and many phone calls, I imagine, oh, after it that. It was awful. They have a very fixed budget. Broadway shows. You can't spend more than you can make. How much you make is fixed, and so the sky is hardly the limit. When I first started in this business, I had a really bad day, and I called a friend of mine who worked at a major Madison Avenue agency, and I said, Jim, tell me something. What's the most over budget you've ever been? Because I was over, and I was afraid to tell the client. And he said, oh, I guess 100, 105, and I said, oh, God, I'm in terrible trouble. I'm $250 oh. over. And he said, Nancy, I meant 100, 105,000. I said, really? That's how they do it? So it's a little different in the oh, theater. Oh, the scale, the, the, the scale is very different. We watch every penny. And so when you're, you're shooting. How important are your personal relations with producers and people that they call you again and again and use you? Is this it's, something it's that you need? It's come to be very important. I mean, I have shorthand with certain producers in the theater that I've worked with for 27 years. And they know, I think, by now, that, that I will leave no stone unturned to sell a ticket. I, I, I don't rest until the closing notice goes up. My, my shows tend to run, I like to think, longer than anyone else's shows. My first, one of my first big shows was A Chorus Line, and then we handled Cats. Um, as they pass that certain mark, the 10,000 performance mark, they're usually mine, and that's because we stay at it as though a show that's in its 10th year just opened last month on Broadway. You, you say mine, so it, it, it sounds very much like you are part of the, uh, the, the theater experience I, there I for you. I feel that way. I feel that You're way. You're not perhaps hired from outside and, you know, Perhaps because in. we're brought in so early. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll design the materials that are actually used to raise money so that when there's a backers audition, they'll put up a poster that we've designed for the show, and it gives the potential backer an idea of how the show will be sold mm -hmm. as well as what the show looks like. So they start to have confidence not only in the property, but how the property will be marketed to the public. And sometimes that makes the difference. Someone will write a check based upon my efforts, so mm -hmm. I feel sometimes kind of instrumental in getting the show on, and I definitely feel instrumental when it's running to keeping it on. Do, do you get nervous on opening night? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I, I, we go back on an opening night back mm -hmm. to the agency, and we sit around with the three televisions on, waiting for the New York Times to come in, waiting for the news in the post, waiting for the, now we, with all, things on computer, we get a lot of things online. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the first thing we do is we, I mean, we read the reviews just the way the producers do. You quickly scan it to see mm -hmm. if there's anything awful. <laughs> you look for the words you can pull out, and you, 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 your heart's in your stomach. Do you ever advise a producer that he ought to close the show? That it's I have. Mm -hmm. I've told him that there is no way at this point to sell it. Um, I, I advised a producer the other day not to do a show, mm -hmm. and God bless him, he sent me flowers the next day. I thought maybe I had overstepped my, <laughs> yeah. my area of expertise, huh. but I didn't think it was saleable the way he was planning to do it. And he decided I was right and sent me flowers to say, thank you, you saved me $400,000. <laughs> Do you ever see a, a, a run through and say, gee, that song is no good, I, you'll have to no. drop that? You, no. you don't get that involved. No, no. I'm, not a, you I'm, I'm not a critic. No. My no. job is not to fix, fix mm -hmm. the show, it's to sell it. And I'm very, very clear on that. I mean, like anyone else, I have a hundred opinions, but usually that's the last thing they need at the point mm -hmm. that I come into the picture is another opinion of what, what they could do to fix it. If someone uh, who's been watching this show might think, well, I'd like to have that as a, a try that profession, mm -hmm. where would you suggest they go? How would they uh, proceed? Well, I mean, we talked a little bit about what they might study, mm -hmm. the courses that they might take. I mean, the only place to do what I do 
for th Broadway is obviously in New York. There are theaters, however, everywhere, and every theater, no matter how little, needs uh, someone to sell tickets. And they could just, you know, start out of town mm -hmm. and work for the local theater in the, in the marketing department, volunteer even, to help sell tickets, get a feel of it. There's always a need to have people who will go out and establish relationships with radio stations, television stations. We have something interesting to barter with. We have tickets. So I tell my students at Yale, if you're working in a small theater in the Middle West, don't think you don't have something incredibly valuable. You have theater tickets. Go out and barter with them. Say, you know, to a radio station, give me four spots, I'll give you ten tickets. Uh. And start on that scale. That's the, it's the same thing that I do. It's on a, just on a different scale. What else would you tell them? Oh, I don't know. Um, you, you've got to be prepared to, to love the whole notion of problem solving because mm -hmm. that's what advertising really is. There's a problem. The problem is there's someone out there who doesn't know anything about your product. Mm -hmm. What's the solution? How do you get to them? So you have to have the head that believes anything's possible. You can't, you can't be a, a fatalist. You can't be, a, uh, that, well, that'll never work. You mm -hmm. have optimism is essential, essential to this. There's a book called Learned Optimism. I'd read that book. Learned be Optimism. Because okay. it is it, it is a it can it can be acquired. It helps mm -hmm. if you're born with it. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm a cheerleader actually is what I am. And I, I try to cheer loudly enough so that I can be heard in New Jersey and out in Long Island. And that's that's where my relationships with the media, my relationships mm -hmm. with we get a lot of calls from magazines that have had an airline that canceled the page. They call us first and say, okay, I've got an ad here. It normally sells for 25000 but the closing is tomorrow. If you can get me an ad, I'll give it to you for 10 This is a person mm -hmm. at a magazine who happens to love the theater, who maybe I took mm -hmm. to an opening night or have a relationship with. And they know that I don't have the kind of budget right. to pay what an airline would pay for a full page in their magazine. So we get bargains and we get breaks based upon the relationships that we develop, not just with the clients, but with the media as well. Are there, is it mainly women? Men in your business? Well, it's very interesting. My agency is split right down the middle. It's half men and half women. Um, it's a very, it's it's an old boys network, or was up until a certain point the theater generally, but it's changing like hmm. everything else. And now we laugh about the old girls network. There are many, many women. Many of my colleagues, many of the general managers and press agents are women today. It's a very um, friendly atmosphere to all minorities. Mm -hmm. And the reason is it's theater, which has been traditionally a home for all <laughs> of those who are slightly <laughs> off center in their thinking. And we have a, quite a collection at the agency. We like to think that we, we're, we have one of every type in that agency. What other personality traits do you see? Optimism, you said, of course, and I guess stamina. But what do you see My, the people that go into your profession? Loyalty. My best employees are those people that the clients sort of start to feel work for them and not for me. And that's because we refer to it as drinking the Kool-Aid. They start to feel like they're working for the show and not for the ad agency. That's the way clients like it, and that's the way I like it, too, because they need to go to the theater a lot. They need to hear what the audiences are saying. They need to be as in tune with the particular production as they are with life in the agency. Mm -hmm. It's not a desk job by any means. It's a get out there and go to the theater job. You need to, you need to be familiar with the product. You need to know it intimately. I've got people in my agency who could put on some of the shows that are on Broadway. They know every line. They know every piece of blocking. They could go on tonight as an understudy. They're so familiar with it. So they go to the rehearsals. Oh, they go to rehearsals. They go to previews. They go to opening night. And then they keep going back. And That's what you, I mean. You, you need to love the theater. When you start with a play like The Elephant Man, do you then you go through the rehearsal? Sure. Pro, sure. The whole process the with whole the people? Process. Do you travel? Do you go on the road when we, the show goes somewhere? We go out of town to see it in previews. The Graduate, which just opened last right. night, um, my account people and creative people have been to see that in two stops along the tour, Baltimore and Toronto. And how important is it to have a relationship with the stars? 
That's it, it, not so important. It, it's helpful when you need photography. It's helpful right. when you need to have someone come in and do a voiceover. Kathleen Turner has done voiceovers for mm -hmm. us on The Graduate. Um, Glenn Close on Sunset Boulevard. I mean, you develop them as, as you go along. Mm -hmm. Some stars are easier to work with than others. Um, it's, it, that's not an essential ingredient in the mix, but they're part of the part of the process. You will very frequently run across a star who is doesn't want to do something and it will become our job to make them want to do it. Well, and I guess if you're sitting through their rehearsals all the time, they either oh, they like get, having you there or they don't like having you there. <laughs> we're not the most visible. The press right. agents are the have the greatest contact with the stars. Right. They having a press agent who has a great relationship with the stars mm -hmm. is very important. That can make all the difference in the world. Do you work with certain press agents? I work with all the press agents. You work with anyone that that, that the show has that hired. They hired. You mm -hmm. don't say, I like this person. And Sometimes I'm asked early on. It depends upon which, you know, a producer has to put together a lot of pieces of the puzzle. Depends upon what piece he puts in first. Mm -hmm. I mean, he may well put in a director who happens to be friendly with the press agent, who happens to work best with an agency, and that will be the order. Occasionally, they have come to me first and say, who do you think would be a good press agent for this show? And I'll make some suggestions. It's, it's hard to tell what's going to come first in the assemblage of a, of a team mm -hmm. to sell a show. If a play gets bad reviews, mm -hmm. can you do anything about it with the ads? I mean, aside from taking out the, a word, but sure. what, what can you do? Well, sometimes th there are there's a subject matter that is so appealing or right for the time. Um, Oklahoma was a play whose a musical whose advance was building mm -hmm. enormously long before the critics came in, and that play was not at all dependent. That musical was not at all dependent upon the critics because it's the kind of show America seems to want to see right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the land we belong to is mm -hmm. grand is a sentiment that's out there today more than ever before, mm -hmm. and so it it is. It's sort of critic-proof. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain shows that the music makes critic-proof. The music is, is ABBA, Mamma Mia, is the kind of show. I mean, the critics were not unkind at all, but they didn't say, this is the greatest musical of the, of the century. They said it's a hostess Twinkie mm -hmm. or a hostess cupcake of a show. But the music is ABBA. So yeah. if you like ABBA music, you're going to go see Mamma Mia. Mm -hmm. You don't have, couldn't care less what Ben Brantley had to say about Mamma Mia. You just want to see those songs on a Broadway stage. Of course, the difference is the prices, when you think of the movies, which often are critic-proof, mm -hmm. the prices are so expensive now to go to the theater. Oh, it's... it's so it's, that it's, people have to read something, I suppose, to know if they want to they go. They would still rather have their next-door neighbor tell them than to have something that they read in the paper. Mm -hmm. They are still much more inclined to believe a friend than anyone else. Mm -hmm. But the price issue is one worth mentioning because when you think about it, it really is quite remarkable that anyone goes to the theater at all, given the cost of the ticket, the cost of parking in mm -hmm. New York City, the cost of eating, transportation mm -hmm. in general. I mean, it's a very, very expensive endeavor. And then think about something else. It's it's not convenient. No. I mean, very few people live in Midtown, New York. They live in New Jersey or Long Island or Connecticut, so it's a real schlep. Mm -hmm. The show starts at 8 o'clock, so you're not going to get home until midnight, the chances are. You've paid a lot. I mean, what on earth would make people do this? So it, it's a miracle to me sometimes when I sit in a theater and I see it <laughs> packed with people. And that tells you about the power of this art form. I mean, it is truly one in which you are a complete participant. You are not just sitting there watching. You are being asked to imagine along mm -hmm. with the people on the stage that you're at a certain place in a certain time. And people truly love it. And they say, I have had very, very few people after a show say to me, boy, was I taken. Even if they didn't love the show, mm -hmm. the experience of going to the theater seemed to be worth it. And the most gratifying responses I get are from parents who've brought children, who have said things that I've, you know, in focus groups that I just love, like the trip home in the car was so wonderful because we had something to talk about. Mm. We were all talking about the same thing. And that's why I... I the Disney addition to Broadway mm -hmm. is, I think, incredibly valuable mm -hmm. because you're seeing a whole new generation of kids in the city being brought up with theater. They've all seen Beauty and the Beast. They're all seeing The Lion, the Lion King. King. And, and, they're all, and they're all learning that there is another 
thing to do in this mm -hmm. world in entertainment besides make movies or be a rock star? I guess there was a certain fear that Disney would not conform to Broadway's way of being, that they would uh, do something like a theme park. Yeah. But I guess that isn't, it hasn't no, turned out to be that not way. Not at all. I, they I, really brought in a big audience. They brought in a big audience. They've hired a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They've hired a lot of Afro-Americans to work mm -hmm. in the theater. They have, I think, extremely good customer service. And I think they've been a role model mm -hmm. for the way people should treat people in the theater. You know, we have a tendency, mm -hmm. because of the unions, to have box office or ushers who are maybe not as friendly. But Disney has that you know, credo that everyone who is sit seated there must be treated like an, uh, an honored guest. Hmm. And so I think in some respects they've upped the standards, <laughs> but mostly they've learned the hard way right. that it is a difficult business to be in, and they've decided to do it anyway. So I have a great deal of respect for them as a company and as a client. Mm -hmm. They've brought a great deal of research to this business. They've brought a great deal of, of um, insight mm -hmm. into how to entertain the world, which is something they've been doing for, for years and years you, and years. You mentioned product uh, endorsements or product alignment. Is that something, another way to get money? That's, that's a relatively a new, new area and it's a little dicier than it would be with sports because sports marketing and sports sponsorships I mean everything has a name on it the AT&T right. Pebble Beach or whatever it is something is always mm -hmm. named but you know that that event is going to take place mm -hmm. every year at that golf course come rain or shine and with theater you know it's it's a little riskier a show could open and it might not run so clients are a little I mean uh, Madison Avenue clients are a little reluctant to affiliate with Broadway shows until mm -hmm. they're up and running and proven to be a hit but there is a growing tendency I think for product not product placement per se because there isn't a director on earth who would let you put a product in a Broadway show just because Can they were paying. Coke right in the not table there happen. no okay I mean theater directors are are very very temperamental about something like that right, no I mean right. I uh, Joe Papp I worked for mm -hmm. and I also do some work for AT&T and I suggested that I put them together and Joe said absolutely not the next thing I know there'll be a phone in every scene <laughs> and I said no I don't think that they would anyone would think that you they could convince you to do that but there is a, still a growing business I feel mm -hmm. in putting together um, Visa, for instance, is doing a lot on Broadway. American Express is doing a lot on Broadway. There are a lot of credit card companies and banks and, and car companies mm -hmm. who realize that our audience is upscale, affluent, intelligent, mm -hmm. um, very, very committed to what they're, how they're spending their evening. They have a certain degree of education, by and large. And so they're an interesting audience to talk to. Mm -hmm. And the best way to talk to them, or one way to talk to them, is in the theater. So it sounds like there might be some more money coming in and then some more jobs and maybe for young Ab people watching this program Absolutely. Uh, there will be Absolutely. opportunity. I think probably every major company right now has a division that is interested in sponsorship of sports and mm -hmm. theater and other enter entertainment vehicles. Are you, do you ever think there was another business you could be in? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel grateful that when I just got into advertising, it was not the Madison Avenue end of it because I actually believe in the product I sell. Mm -hmm. I don't have to pretend that I think that this is something that the consumer should do. I really think it's something the consumer should do. I can't quite imagine. I mean, I, I love going to the theater and encouraging other people to do that seems perfect. Thank you so very much. You learned a lot and enjoyed oh, talking with thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. We've been talking with Nancy Korn, who's the CEO of the Theatrical Advertising Agency. And for the American Theatre Wing, I'm Pia Lindstrom. The American Theatre Wing's Guide to Careers in the Theatre is a project of the American Theatre Wing and the New York Public Library's Billy Rose Theatre Collection, Theatre on Film and Tape Archive.